Hi Internet, I thought I'd get a little closer for this review. I'm Antoinette van Kron and this is In the Company of the Court Stan by Sarah Dunnant. Dunnant? Yes, Dunnant. And this is was an interesting book. I really took a while to get into it. I don't know if I ever fully loved it, but it definitely made me think and it took me a while to get a full my full fist around the the theme of the book it made me think a lot because the theme was so shrouded that i struggled to figure out what the author was trying to say not that all authors always say something in their novels but this one really felt like she had something to say and i struggled to find that so this is a historic novel from the 17th century italy so Rome is being attacked, Florence is thriving as the new capital. It's, it's a complicated world. And I was really intrigued by the idea of being a courtesan in this world, discovering the world from such a different perspective. And obviously it's the world's oldest profession. But how many stories do we really have from this point of view? So I was immediately intrigued. So, getting into the style and pacing, it was slow, really slow. I put it down a couple of times while reading and I just, yeah, I, I hate doing that. I hate, to, I hate getting bored with the book and then putting it down for a couple of weeks and then remembering, oh, I was reading that. I want to be into a story. I want to be part of it. And there were some things that happened... At the beginning, there's a scene where a man's intestines are spilling out into the street and it felt so distant. Things like that usually affect me and it didn't feel real. I was in this character's mind experiencing it with him and I just, it felt really far away and I'm not mad about that. Okay, sugar and vinegar. Uh, the sugar here was the premise so as i said i was fascinated by being a part or seeing the perspective i was fascinated by seeing the perspective of 17th century italy from the perspective of courtesan and then i got a step stranger i was in the mind of a pimp he's the courtesan's it's not a master per se, they're partners, but he does all the accounting stuff and he organizes the clients. And he's also a dwarf, or that's what they call it here. I don't know what physical disability he has exactly, but he refers to himself as grotesque and short of stature and physically weak. And his joints begin to hurt if he walks for too long. So he definitely has some sort of physical disability. I don't know enough to really say which one. So that was really interesting. It's really something I didn't expect and was pleasantly surprised by. And then his intellect just made me love the character. But then overall, the vinegar has to be the characters. I never, I never really cared about any of them. I think there are three main characters, the pimp, his lady, and then, um, this La Droka, La Draca, something like that, a uh, healer girl that they meet along the way. And they're really in danger a lot. And I just, I, I don't know if I ever really cared because I never really got to know them on a deeper level. There aren't really character arcs here. There are characters going through things, but they feel more like objects, like plot devices moving through the world, than people. So I really struggled to connect with the characters. Then, would I recommend it? No. It's slow. It, there are no sex scenes, no fight scenes, no excitement. There's a war, but you're on the peripheral and that's interesting like it is 
we always hear stories about heroes in the midst of things and now we're kind of off to the side and it's fascinating it's fascinating being in this part of society being literally being the sinners but somehow higher than the rest of society from a moral and intellectual perspective it's really interesting from that point of view but i don't know if this is the best story to do that the perspective is interesting but does that make the book worth it i'm not sure and as i said i did put it down a couple of times so i can't in good faith recommend it sorry So, getting into spoilers, as I said, I had a little bit of trouble getting my grip around the theme of this, but I did, finally, after a lot of thought afterwards, and going back to a couple of passages that I remember, uh, some discussion about how it isn't sinful to use sex as for business, but it is sinful for the courtesan to give away her services for free, because that that's sin. So... Those things were really interesting and the way she plays with men's expectations of her and the way she plays with her wit and how her wit and her hair are her most beautiful features that draw in the most people. So it was really interesting. But, and there was a lot, there was a lot to play with. And I know I'm drawing this out a little bit, but I did go through all these processes trying to figure out what is this book trying to say, I think. I think the theme here is power. It's an explicit defense of hard power and an explicit denial of any might, any real might in soft power. The courtesan and her pimp have a lot of influence over people. They have influence over all her clients. They have influence about some of their suppliers um, and some of their servants. But in the end, without the physical might to keep hold of that power, they keep losing. There's no manipulation, no amount of influence that can save them in the end. They have all this hope because of the influence and because of all the soft powers she possesses. And it never amounts to anything. So, just to clarify the definitions, uh, in a political sense, hard power would be the USA's ability to bomb the shit out of people. And then soft power would be the USA's ability to do trade wars, to put sanctions in place. So hard power refers to physical might, and then soft power refers to your influence or what benefits um, you can give to people. So let's get into the plot so I can prove why I think that power is the theme here and especially a defense of hard power is the only substantial way to have any might and to really have power. So we start off the book and the courtesan is rich, affluent and loved. She lives in some of the best parts of Rome. She has tens of servants. She has a great hall for dining and entertaining guests. She is decked out with the best jewels, her hair is done by the best people, artists come to draw her, and she has all the soft power in the world. And then Rome is attacked. And instead of trying to flee in the streets like a common peasant, she decides to put her soft power to use. She is a courtesan. She knows how to woo and control men. So... Instead of panicking, she tells her servants, let us host these men. Let us put on a feast. And they wait for one of the captains to come in. And they host them. And they entertain them. And they put on the best feast with all the splendor and luxury that Rome can buy. And after the men are done with her, they... I don't... They sculpt her. They cut off her hair in such a way that it leaves permanent scars on her scalp and on her scalp and her hair is one of her prime points of pride and she feels lost without it and in the end they're still fleeing from Rome helpless refugees I think the pimp has swallowed all the jewels that they can carry and it's just it's 
nothing. Their soft power amounted to nothing. Her influence, her beauty, all her kindness, all her grace in handling these foreign invaders, nothing. So then they arrive in Florence at the courtesan's mother's home. She has died and they have a servant there and they start selling off the jewelry and trying to figure out how they're going to establish themselves and their business in Florence. Florence is a bit more complicated. The only way the courtesans can really advertise their goods is in the church, <laughs> which is once again why I said it was complicated figuring the theme out of this, because there are so many whores in the church. There are no more place for proper ladies. They're eyeing their targets and they're smiling sweetly and they're dressed so nicely, more modestly than any other of the ladies. And that's kind of how the men know who they are. So they advertise themselves there and they schmooze and they network. And then Sunday night they'll get their visitors. So that's complicated. <laughs> um, and then they are left with only one ruby and still no access to the database that the church keeps of where the courtesans are located. So their clients can't get to them. And the ruby gets stolen, their final piece of jewelry, their final money. It, once again, her kindness has meant nothing. So some old friends from Rome come into town and she makes nice with them again. And they help the courtesan and friends up onto their feet again. And it goes well. So then they're back on their feet and they're rich and they're affluent again and clients are flowing. So clients are flowing like the rivers of Venice and they are rich. And so then Buccino, our main character, the pimp, uh, he decides to go spend some of his money and he wants to bet on some of the battles that they kind of gladiators on boats. And the crowd stampedes, and for all his wealth, he's entirely ignored and shoved into the river. And he almost drowns, and he spends the next couple of weeks with the most terrible headache because the dirty Venetian water has flown into his ears, and because of his sort of misshapen skull, the water can't get out. And it's terrible, and he goes through a lot of pain, and again, his wealth, his affluence, his soft power has meant nothing because of the physical force of the crowd. And then finally, the last part where we really see influence means nothing. Soft power is in power. Influence over powerful people is in power. Power is power. Their friend, the healer girl, is accused of witchcraft. The reasons and whether she's actually guilty, meh. But they decide to try to save her. And the courtesan flutters her eyes. And she woos and she influences and she tries. But her clients are not willing to put themselves on the line for her. And La Droga dies. She is choked to death and thrown in the river. She would have just been drowned, but that is all soft power can buy you, is a better execution. So I think that's the theme of this book. Every time they think they are now rich and affluent and powerful, the world comes along and just shoves. Shoves them into the river, shoves their friend into prison, just physically shows them that they are inferior and they will remain inferior. Because no matter how much wealth you can amass, you are still a courtesan. You are still a sinner among a Catholic city. You are still a sinner among a Catholic po populace. You are not a noble. You don't really have power. You have influence. And influence is entirely at the mercy of those you influence.
and influence is entirely at the mercy of the powerful. And that is fascinating. So let's start with the characters. The lady, Famienta Bainichi, I don't know. She is elegant and strong and full of sexual prowess and energy. She uses her wit to woo her clients and her hair. These are her main features, her wit and her hair. And she can also sing and play the lute. And she's just a well-rounded <laughs> courtesan, I suppose. And she's really good at flirting. And what joy it is watching her play these men. It's fascinating and I loved it. She really makes the role seem glamorous. And Benicio himself, um, he's stubborn, witty, intelligent, uh, a bit morose. He can be difficult, very analytical, um, good at bribing, good at uh, negotiating contracts, things like that. He's a good account keeper for her and him and the lady are partners and mostly they get along they fight only once over her having fallen in love with the client so this is probably the part of the book that stayed with me is the idea that the courtesan and her pimp have about sin they don't believe what they're doing is sinful as long as it remains business only. They, she's not selling her soul, she's selling her body. But then she accidentally falls in love with one of her young clients. He's excited about her, who makes her feel like a woman again. And she starts offering her services for free. And this is for the first time that the pimp sees her as sinful. Because now she's selling her soul. Now she's now it's not business. Now it's emotional. It's real. And that makes it terrible. It's the price you pay to be in this business to never have a real relationship. To never find real love. And it's an interesting look at what it means to sell a part of yourself and to divide yourself into pieces morally she is a catholic a christian she goes to church sometimes to woo men sometimes for herself she pays the price for all her sins and yet she sees herself as of higher as one of higher moral fiber than those around her even though she is a prostitute and that is something that most people would frown upon she takes care of those in her company. She's generally kind, generous. It's, it's fascinating the way that she sees herself in this situation, the way she, that she finds dignity in what she's doing. At one point, there's an artist who wants to paint a picture of her, and... Afterwards, two men stand and discuss the painting with um, Bonici and they asked him what he sees in her eyes. And they all say, yes, that's, that's the face of the courtesan, the woman who will do anything, be anything for the pleasure of others. And that's the ideal woman. And that in itself was just really interesting to read how she was so, she seemed so in control of her life. They're paying her thousands to sit still and pretty, but she's still selling a part of herself that no longer belongs to her. Her soul is hers alone, but her body has been divided up so many times that others don't see it as her property anymore, even though she still does. She never loses her own dignity, but it's about the social standing that she then gets and the way that others, even though they are very respectful of her in person, she never gets abused. 
they do have a different mindset about her, as if she is not her own, as if she exists only for them. And that's interesting. I don't know whether it's true. This is just one story, one courtesan, one situation in 17th century Venice. But it is one that made me think. So I will see you next week. Thanks for watching. Please comment, like and subscribe. Bye bye.